gentlemen, and welcome to another Public Interest Fathers, our second counter-inaugural ball. Now, as some of you may be aware, there are certain other festivities going on in um, certain other parts of town, uh, but we felt a little left out of those. So we have decided to throw ourselves a party, and we have invited you. Now, these are very challenging times for people in the public interest movement. There are, are many problems to face. And um, in, in facing these problems, we would like to prove that we can forget our troubles as well as anybody. <laughs> uh, or perhaps, if not forget, at least ignore them for one night. <laughs> so tonight, as you think about these challenging times ahead, you may wonder, uh, where do we begin? What do we do first? Well, we here at the Public Interest Follies definitely have our priorities straight. Uh, if you ask us, what's the first step? Of course we reply, we won't! Just for you. Brought to you by Nick. 
National Conservative Cable Corporation. Your favorite stuff, your favorite songs, your favorite videos, like Lionel Richie singing his new hit, Running with the Right. After a family dispute last year over Michael Reagan's need for psychiatric help, the nation's eccentric first family is now kissed and made up. And this weekend, the kids are all in town to join Nancy and Ron for the second inaugural. We now join the Reagan children on the east front of the Capitol. Because Nancy doesn't want the 
adopted son at the little ceremony. <laughs> Jane Wyman finding you on the doorstep. God knows Dad never treated you any worse than his natural children. He didn't leave you to twist slowly in the wind like me when I ran for the Senate. <laughs> you think he's treated you badly? He hasn't made one call to his friends in Hollywood on behalf of my career. I know that he could have gotten me a cameo on Falcon Crest if he really wanted to. <laughs> I do not know what you three are all bitching about. All I wanted to be was left alone to dance. They didn't make you get married and you give up your career. Oh, come on, Nijinsky. We all know you got married for one reason. To prove that Dad's only got two daughters. <laughs> You garbage disposal! You little cupcake! Thunder flies! Oh, oh, stop! This is really doing a bad trip on my karma. <laughs> Paul says it really upsets the cosmic vibrations when people fight. Remember, it's important for siblings to support each other. Presidential siblings. You can push the ERA, but we don't care. And we don't mind the tutus you wear. Siblings, siblings, never been such unbeloved siblings. If Nancy had a tree, she'd pick another crew. Ron Howard for me, three Osmond for you. Carrie, Sherry, when in public smiles, we are playing.
This is my wife. She's warm, she's sensuous, she's got a high-powered career, three beautiful children who all attend Montessori school. <laughs> she's a marathon runner, she's got a very supportive husband, and uh, <coughs> a lover. <laughs> my wife, I think I'll keep her. Honey? To keep up with today's changing lifestyles, women need more iron and vitamins. They need have it all for today's total woman. <laughs> you saw them on the cover of Newsweek. Now you can see them in real life. We take you now to Cleveland Park. <laughs> Dear, isn't it delightful to have a Saturday morning alone together? Want some more decaf espresso? Oh, please. <laughs> you know, I'm almost glad my handball game fell through. Sweetheart. Hey, do we have any interesting names? Well, no, just mostly bills and old catalogs oh, from L.L. Bean, Zolo, Bloomingdale's, and oh, a fundraising letter from the acquaintances of the earth. Meet Scott and Christy, a typical yuppie couple who thought they were going to spend their first Saturday morning together in two years. What they don't know is that their lives are about to change dramatically, for they are about to enter the direct solicitation zone. <laughs> Personality test. <laughs> no. Don't you want to be happy? I am happy. No, you're not. L. Ron Hubbard's dianetics can change your life. Uh, no, thank you. Not interested. Do you believe that? At this hour of the morning. I'll get this one, dear. You eat your brioche. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah. hi. My name is Kevin, and I'm selling magazine subscriptions. Honey, you know, we're too busy. We don't have time to read magazines. Oh, give me a break, lady. I just need 30 more subscriptions, and I win a Sony Walkman, a trip to Rio for Carnival, not to mention that my dad's going to match my CD account, so come on! Children's parents. I don't understand. Unbelievable. I'll get it. I'll get it. Hello. <laughs> Hello, registered Democrat. We understand you have not contributed one dime to the recent campaign of that of Walter Mondale. Democrat? <laughs> Me? Update your database. <laughs> it was a computer. It was a Democrat. Oh, 
Nazi, and I am the NRA. <laughs> There are people in this country who want to take away from you your God-given right to keep and bear arms. Well, we at the NRA firmly believe that... All right! Everybody against the wall! Not you. Now, now, now you! Me, take out your wallet. Now you make a donation to the clean air and save everything. You buy some makeup from her and give it to L. Ron Hubbard. You join the NRA and you take that nuts personality test. All right, everybody, out, 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 out. short over at Vomit Studios, a wholly owned subsidiary of Charnel House Communications. <laughs> Under searing pressure from the corporate executives, producer J.B. Butcher has got to come up with another blockbuster. Can the studio duplicate its past hits? Will they recreate the international intrigue of Nestle, the White Menace? Will they match the gut-wrenching power of the Dalcon Shield, still playing at some area theaters? Will they generate the hometown appeal of Slow Burn, the horror in Harrisburg? J.B. is worried. What does it take these days to make the public weep in the aisles and pay through the nose? Will the scriptwriters come up with something to suit contemporary taste? Will J.B. whip them into shape? Let's watch. <laughs> it's been three weeks since I told you Bozo to get me a mass extermination idea. It's not that easy, J.B. Ever since the day after. Oh, TV drivel. I need something that could happen. Something you can taste. I'm working on a script, J.B. Mexico City. In a slum, next to an oil refinery, there's an explosion. 600 kids burned it out. Forget the public won't get out their handkerchiefs over spit kids getting fried. <laughs> Eddie, what have you got? Well, <laughs> I'm going for a more exotic ambiance. And I've set this one in, Inja. It's called the Poisoned Cloud. Poisoned Cloud? <laughs> a teeming Indian village. At night, the camera eye peeps into the shanties. Shadows dance on dirt floor. A scorpion scurries down the wall. Four, six, ten people crammed into a room. And slowly... We could get Robbie Shine. Incident, the corporate president oh, lies in it. Come on! Another accident movie! China Syndrome Silkwood! It's been done to death. Well! <laughs> I think I've got something a little different. <laughs> Ethiopia! Yeah. 
<laughs> but why Ethiopia? If the public wants to see starving Negroes, we can set it in Chicago. <laughs> they can care less about them in Chicago, JB, but they'll pay to see them in Ethiopia. <laughs> And there's a commie dictator. James Earl Jones. And he won't let the food get to the rebel. And the British, they send Bosco. Ha! <laughs> the kids all get sick because they're lactose intolerant. <laughs> Coming soon to cable, RTV, Republican television, with your favorite reactionary rockers, like Cindy Lauper singing her new smash hit. <laughs> Come 
on, Dad. She looks just like you. <laughs> That's impossible. You were adopted. <laughs> but, Dad, everybody needs a grandfather and a grandmother, too. Get a foster grandparent. <laughs> Dad, this is one baby that deserves your attention. Why, if it wasn't for you, deficit wouldn't exist. Michael, I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> Dad, Dad, what have you done with deficit? Gosh darn it, son, the little bugger up and disappeared. <laughs> Tonight, you're going to be privileged to witness a wedding that makes the royal wedding pale in comparison. And you're seeing it live on CBS, Christian Broadcasting Service. <laughs> Based on by Jessa Helms and other conservative stockholders. <laughs> by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the President of the United States to perform this very special ceremony here today. On this occasion, I am honored to have with me my blessed family, faith, hope, charity, and intolerance. <laughs> Pronouncing. 
Now with this cross, I do hereby pronounce you church and state, wedded together forever and ever, amen. You may now kiss the bride. <laughs> now, we'll end this ceremony with one of those good old-fashioned Christian hymns. Daughter. intermission public interest fathers is overjoyed to inform you of the existence of a cash bar at your disposal just off the entry lobby to this theater for your intermission pleasure Senoritas for the cerveza, and they welcome the occasional visitor to this forgotten little corner of the world. Sounds of the surrounding jungle mingle with the subtle strains of the guitar, but somewhere has been discovered.
Bages. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, I see we have more kidney patients than anyone else, so we'll start with you. But I only have one pair of kidneys, and there's four of you, so you better start bidding. We're starting to bidding at $10,000. Do I hear $11,000? Ma'am, you're looking a little bit swollen in the front row. I suggest you take out your wallet. What do you mean you don't have money? I knew a woman last week who gave her right arm for a kidney. Okay, too late. I bought a taker over here. Gone for $12,000. Okay, now we're going to pick up the beat a little bit with the heart auction. Do you hear about... Oh, I'm sorry. Too late. I'm really sorry, Mrs. Schroeder. Or is it Schroeder? Okay, now we're on to the liver. Do I hear $5,000? Okay, no takers. How about $4,000? $3,000? What about... Chop liver for $1.29 a pound. Okay, what a deal. All right. <laughs> now, now we have our special 15-second speed auction for miscellaneous parts. I won't tell you what you get until you cough up the cash, okay? We have, okay, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, okay, gone for $800. You're a real lucky man, let me tell you what you got. You have a gallbladder and a esophagus, and it looks like an unidentifiable mucous membrane. I'm sure you'll find something really good to do with that. Okay. Now, hey, don't moan. We'll be back next week when we have a special eye bank for glaucoma patients. And you, even though you lost out of the kidney, I'll keep a special eye out for you next week, okay? Okay. So remember, remember, if you're not feeling quite together, Think in Humana. <laughs> And now, a special public service presentation for the Committee on the Ever-Present Danger, warning us of yet another national security threat. Minnesota. Ball games and picnics in the land of 10,000 lakes. Halfbacks and lumberjacks, virgin prairie land, pumpkin and apple stands. A rich heritage. But last November, Minnesota departed from its wholesome tradition when it was the only state to vote against our president. Now, press reports reveal that a small band of extremists has seized control of the state. These smuggled photos show that in the last two months, life has been completely transformed in this once tranquil land. Broadcast daily from the state capitol, a radio show called The Prairie Home Comrade. And the scourge is spreading. The twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul aligning with their new sister cities behind the Iron Curtain, Buddha, and Pest. <laughs> Will the nation's foremost dairy state become its first police state? Let us tell you what happened to the Swenson family, <laughs> who used to sell their pumpkins and fruits at a thriving roadside stand. No more. That was before last November, when the Novemberists took control of Minnesota. And now, their once thriving farm, the picture of America as it once was, has been taken over by the state. And the Swensons have been relocated to a remote camp to do forced labor. Now the Swenson family earnings go to pay for welfare cheats socialized medicine, abortions on demand. The people of the state have let down their guard. Lassitude and weakness prevail. This has already begun in Central America. And those of you who don't see this truth are simply not looking at the parallels. <laughs> Is it too late for Minnesota? We must wake up. Conquest has been in the blood of Minnesotans for centuries. How long will it be before the 
fear begins stalking its prey across the North Dakota state line. This diagram, prepared by the Pentagon, demonstrates the growing U.S.-Minnesota firepower gap. Signs of military buildup are everywhere. A rebuilt Navy. A huge army. Newly constructed missile silos. An armored force ready to sweep across the plains. Political indoctrination sessions have already begun. And recent intelligence data shows that Minnesota is receiving outside aid. Three days ago, under cover of darkness, a convoy of trucks was sighted. We tracked those trucks. We are now certain that they are approaching Minnesota with a shipment of crates. We cannot allow our enemies to link up. Or we too will end up just like the Swensons. Now remember folks, if you want to show this slide tape presentation in your church, sports organization, or gun club, contact the committee on the ever-present page. TV for you, the hip, young, upwardly mobile, and Republican music lover. See right wing rock's own royal badness, Prince. That's right, Prince. <laughs> But that's not important to get the part They'll have to wait till 88 To get another try Another try Now they just blame each other This is what it sounds like when liberals cry There's supposed to be a warm-up session, though, before we get into the really heavy stuff. Heavy stuff? Oh, Wilbur, are you sure we ought to take this course? I'm a little frightened. Don't be silly. You want to get into high society, don't you? Well, this is the way it's done these days. Remember what Muffy and Buffy told us? <laughs> I know. Their advice is so far. We moved into the right neighborhood. We joined the right club. We volunteered for the right charities, and we enrolled the kids in the right school. And I even learned to ride side saddles. But do we really have to get into kinky sex? <laughs> this place is a tomb. I don't care. We're going through it with the That's what I'm afraid of. Don't chicken out on me. 
Damn it, honey, you'd do anything that Klaus von Bulow told you, wouldn't you? If it improves our social position, yes. I know, the right tennis coach, the right French tutor, the right exercise salon, she... Right, and the right s and master. Why, darling, they think this guy taught Alfred Bloomingdale everything. <laughs> Get ready, I think I hear the old guy. <laughs> Thank you, Chambers. Thank you. Oh, Chambers. Aren't you forgetting something? <gasps> you can't get good help anymore. <laughs> Well, welcome to my class. We'll start with a, a little basic warm-up exercise. Good. Now, I assume you all bought the proper gear. Oh, yes, sir. sir. Then let's see it. Let's see it. We haven't got all night. Another class comes in here when the bar is closed. Hurry it up. Hurry it up. Faster. Well, we'll have to do I don't know why you had to go by the cheap stuff. <laughs> okay, class, let's get started. Face the mirror and bend over. Please, sir, before we start, I have just one question. This is my, our first experience with S&M, and I hate to sound naive, but, uh, doesn't it hurt? <laughs> hurt? You pick up tennis, you might get tennis elbow. You go out riding, you might get thrown. You get involved in s and in sex, you might get a little roughed up. But it's like everything else, you take it a little at a time, and then just go easy. I'll, uh... I'll explain it to you. A little s and -M. never hurt anyone, won't hurt anyone. A little s and -M. a little s and -M. can't excite anyone, scratch or bite anyone, friendship or friend. A slap up on the butt, some talk of filth and smut. Is just a way of saying that I love you, dearie. A little s and -M. never hurt anyone, so won't you try a little s and -M. A little s and -M. need to shame anyone or defame anyone. A little s and -M. a little s and -M. can't amuse anyone. Needn't bruise anyone, including Auntie M. They say that love is blind. It is when you're blindfolded. Being whipped and scolded, count them one, two, three, four. A little s and -M. Never anyone so want to try a little s and -M. Yes, sir! So won't you try a little s and -M. Okay, you dogs. Show me what you've learned and make it burn. Do 
moving right along into the 22nd century, in fact, we bring you to a time when liberalism has become extinct. Good afternoon, fellow journalists, and welcome to the National Press Club. As always, we've taken your written questions in advance, and I will be asking them today of our fascinating guest. It's hard to believe that in the year 2180, there are still any survivors left from the ancient tribe of liberals. But anthropologists have made an amazing discovery. A 2,000-year-old liberal has been found alive in the La Brea Tar Pits near Santa Monica, California. <laughs> He is with us today to answer your questions about his amazing life and share with us some of his wisdom. <laughs> Sir, I must say you look exceedingly well preserved for a 2,000 year old liberal. Thanks a million, y'all. Yeah, he'll sweep up. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've been into aerobics now for years, must be two, three centuries at least, and I never, ever eat fried food. In fact, I was the one who got Jane Fonda into her health shtick. You knew Jane Fonda? Oh, yeah, I was an agent. I said, Janie, baby, listen to Papa. You're getting creamed on this radical stuff. Gives to Hanoi, nuclear power. Who needs it? Better you should open a health salon. Make a video, anything. But that was a tremendous success. She must have been very grateful to you. Are you kidding? She never once thanked me. I didn't get a percentage of any of it. And then she drops me as an agent. I still think her husband put her up to it. Tom Hayden, I spit on you, you know, goodness. You sound... <laughs> you sound very bitter. Well, I never get the credit I deserve. You heard it in the New Deal? Of course. My idea. <laughs> Wait a minute. The history books all say that was President Franklin Roosevelt's great achievement. Ah, he was a lovely man, a good-looking guy, a great speaker. But the New Deal was not his idea. Sure, he implemented it. But do you think a boy aristocrat like that do anything from deficit spending? Not on your life! And then what happens? He gets re-elected in a landslide! Have you known other presidents? Right. More than I can remember. I have known the great and the near great. And some of them I remember today as heroes, you know, big saviors of humanity. <laughs> but they weren't really like that, let me tell you. Who do you have in mind? Uh, like Lincoln. Wait, he was a real sourpuss. And not such a great humanitarian either. But he freed the slaves, didn't he? Who are you kidding? It is because of me that he freed the poor Schwarzen. <laughs> it's like pulling teeth to get him to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. What do you mean? Well, I was his chief domestic advisor, and I was pleased with him, maybe, baby, for God's sake, have a heart. The slaves, they're getting bipped all the time, walking around in chains. You gotta do something with your freedom already. But Mr. Stoneface would just sit there and say, not yet. The war effort comes first. So let's turn him around. Ah, he wanted to start the National Basketball Association. That's all. <laughs> and then, then, Mr. Gray Emancipator, he's got this big change of heart, and he says to me, buddy, get off my back already. You want me to free the slaves? All right, I'll free the slaves. Now, are you happy? So, what happened? Now they give him a big holiday, and I'm just a poor schmuck nobody ever hired us. Some thanks, huh? I see what you mean. <clears throat> What's the biggest change in government you've seen over the years? Well, then I was in the government back in the 1960s. We did some crazy things that nobody would even dream about trying today. We, this may sound unbelievable, but back in those days when people were hungry, they said, all right, give them a little food, give them some money to live on, pay their doctor bills, stuff like that. They even used the tax money to pay for it. Oh, well, whoa. You actually use tax money to pay for social services? <laughs> <laughs> Why did liberalism die? Hey, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. I can try it away, so just get off my case. That sounds very defensive. Uh, that's what you would have said. But I was Walter Mondale's chief strategist. <laughs> right before he gives his big acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention, I say, Cliff, Judy, this speech is all you. You gotta do something to attract attention. Show up, people, you got some books for. Like what? That's what he said. So I told him, go up there and tell them, I promise to raise your taxes. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> but I made the tax line as a joke, of course. But by then, he's walking up to the podium, and boom, it's too late. Another member of our audience wants to know, do you have any advice 
for young people who want to become liberals? Oh, I yeah, certainly do. Don't be so selfish all the time. If a poor person comes up to you and is dropping dead from hunger at your feet, you might consider giving him a little piece of bread from your pocket, Mr. Big Shot. <laughs> and, it, and it wouldn't hurt my son David or my 200 other children to give me a call once in a while to let me know he's still alive. <laughs> but what can you do with these kids? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I got plenty of time. As a matter of fact, after the Democratic Party been out of business, ha, I got nothing left but time. <laughs> Coming to cable, RTV, Republican television brings you the party's party's party, the queen of conservatism herself, you guessed it, Miss <laughs> Tina Turner. <laughs> Investments grow. Take a dance, keep on and in. Proud that you keep on turning. In these trying times, it's nice to know there's someone who cares. Hotline, may I help you? Gilder! What? Gilder! You've been reading George Gilder? <laughs> Wealth and poverty. 400 pages today. Oh my god. Have you been mixing? Did you read anything else? Thomas Saul. Four chapters this afternoon. Anything else? Well, uh, I... Listen, buddy, I can't help you unless you tell me exactly what you've been reading. Oh, oh, okay. Mandate for leadership, too. The whole thing? No, no, no. Just the transportation chapter. <laughs> Were you memorizing? No, no, never memorize, never memorize. Just skim, just skim. <laughs> okay, hang on, don't panic. Let me see. Gilder, soul, mandate transportation. Extremely dangerous to self and others. Use caution, keep off subways. <laughs> How do you feel? Feel? Like cutting food stamps. Like, like locking up criminals for two and three hundred years. I, I want to pack a rod. I want to shoot Bambi. <laughs> I want to drive 80 miles an hour down the interstate. I feel, I feel intensely privatized. <laughs> That's normal. That's normal for the who's been into the hard stuff. Now tell me, when did you first start doing conservatism? First? Well, I never used to do anything harder than John Kenneth Galbraith. That, that's when a friend at the health club turned me on to a, a little high tech. Then it was small submarines, enterprise zones. Pretty soon I was stealing to support my Irving Crystal habit. I found myself hanging out at the Heritage Foundation just waiting for somebody to issue a policy paper. I didn't, I didn't care what the subject was. I'd read anything, anything. I, 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 I'm so ashamed. It's okay. Because I've been there, brother. And I know. And now I'm a healthy liberal again. And what helped me was getting reconnected to my social environment. So is there anyone there who can help you, who can be with you, someone you like and trust? Say... A big brother. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, let's try this. Have you got a letter from a personal friend around? 
Oh, oh yeah, yes. Yes, I, I have that. Here's one from somebody who writes to me almost every single week. Perfect. Now read it out loud to me. Okay. It says, Dear Jeff, did you know that cannibalism and the murder of our infants and elderly are routinely taught in our godless public school system? Did you know? Put it down. Put it down. Bad news. Let's stick to something safer. Have you any pictures of some friends around? Oh, oh yes. Here's one of me and my best friend hiking in the Grand Canyon. Nature. Perfect. Now what I want you to do is look at it very carefully and tell me what you see. Well, well it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's undeveloped land. <laughs> <laughs> case than I thought. Okay, we're going to have to resort to the most horrifying, most drastic shock treatment available. Ready? Repeat after me. President Newt Gingrich. 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 Whoa. Yeah. Yes. It's starting to clear away. I'm beginning to feel compassionate. Yeah. A little politically naive. Uh-huh. Maybe even a touch wasteful. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I feel like a trillion bucks. How can I ever repay you? That'll be a $65 user fee. What? Right. You take Visa. Y user fee. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're in the private sector now. You'll understand the government cut off our HHS grant. Kill yeah, mass transit. transit. What? Nuclear power reigns. Hello? Barefoot and pregnant. Guns don't kill. People do. Trees pollute. Ah! The following cultural program was not brought to you by the Mobile Oil Corporation. <laughs> we now present part one of a new series, A Delicate Imbalance, Our Governments at Work. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm your host, Alistair Croc. <laughs> and I'm pompous and pseudo-intellectual. <laughs> Welcome to our presentation in which we examine how a bill becomes a law. <laughs> President Reagan has asked us to make the legislative process understandable to you, the common person. <laughs> and so we turn to dance to bring this magnificent system to life. Maestro? Congress. The executive branch <laughs> came up with a plum of an idea for deficit reduction. Congress eats up the idea, so to speak, and a bill incorporating all the administration's brilliant ideas is introduced. Democrats and Republicans alike applaud the bill. In a few short moments, a vote is taken. The bill is unanimously approved and signed into law. <laughs> And so the President, Congress, and the American people all lived happily ever after. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, federal regulations require that we give an opposing viewpoint. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me as we endure the bad experimental dance theater with their own version of how a bill becomes a law. Mr. Congress. A member of Congress 
hears from the constituents. He's concerned about jobs for minority and youth. Our neophyte advocate is assured of prompt action. <laughs> Finally, our member's conscience gets the better of him, and a bill is introduced, the Employment Equity for Minorities and Youth Act. <laughs> a senator introduces a companion bill, almost identical to the original bill. Although shrewd observers will note, the companion is taller. Enter the lobbyists. Some extol the bill's virtues. Others, others want to kill the bill. But our bill survives, and so begins the torturous journey through committee in both houses. on the floor. <laughs> now it will be transformed by the political ambitions of 435 members of the House of Representatives. <laughs> Not to mention 100 senators. Proponents fight to preserve the bill's integrity. But opponents do a cost-benefit analysis. Providing all those jobs will bust the budget. So, in the spirit of compromise, the amendment process begins. To cut costs, Congress creates a pilot program in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Next, an amendment ensures that the bill will help only those truly deserving of employment assistance. The President's children, Jean Kirkpatrick, and Geraldine Ferraro's former counsel. But estimates project the bill will provide employment for 42 people. <laughs> Congress wonders, is the bill really worth it? <laughs> Supporters offer riders that will broaden the scope of the bill. <laughs> Tax incentives, investment credits, loan guarantees, sub-minimum wage, public-private partnerships, and of course, a multi-billion dollar Pentagon program for development of new wrench technologies. 